You know, all of us come on a Sunday like this or in our everyday life with problems. And um, I was listening to a preacher talk about um, salvation, Easter, these things. And he said, you know, in comparison with the two major problems that all of us deal with, which are um, sin and death, um, every other problem just seems like, his words, a flea bite. Um, it's just in comparison, because all of us have to deal and wrestle with sin, and all of us have to deal with death. And yet what we sing this morning, and we can sing with confidence this morning, um, in Christ alone, no guilt in life, sin dealt with because of the cross. No fear in death, death dealt with because of the resurrection. This is our good news. This is our gospel that we celebrate this morning. And so, you know, when we think about Easter, when we think about the death and the resurrection of Christ, we, we tend to think of of this word salvation. This is our rescue story. And as I was thinking about rescue and as I was thinking about salvation, it, it, it caused me to think about a time last year that I needed some rescue. Um, that two of my daughters needed some rescue. And um, we were um, on a little two, three day vacation in Monterey at Lover's Point. And um, um, it was a beautiful day, and there's a little cove over here, and then if, once you go past the point, it kind of goes out to the open ocean, and we rented a paddleboard that morning, and, um, you know, they didn't get life jackets because it was just in this small cove, and so, you know, we were like, okay, and so we were, you know, enjoying ourselves, listening to music, and, you know, the kids are playing they were jumping off this little cliff that there is. Some were going to tide pools. And, you know, as I'm walking, watching everything unfold, I see Kayla and Savannah start to drift and start to drift. And it's getting further on in the day. And so the wind's picking up and the, the current is going out further. And I'm like, okay. I'm... Then I see them like trying to, you know, paddle and paddle and paddle and they're not making any progress whatsoever. And so finally I go, I turn to my wife and I say, I need to go get them. There's no way that they're going to be able to paddle back um, on their own. And so I grab like a boogie board and I jump in and I start swimming out to them on their little paddle board. And um, I'm paddling and paddling and it's really getting worse. Like the, 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 it, the tide is turning in a sense. And there were two kayaks that were coming in um, and they had life jackets on and they were in a kayak. It was a father and a son and another um, two people and they, they were coming in. And right when I went out to go get my kids, um, the, there was a guy who said, I've been here paddle boring forever and there's no way that they're going to make it. So I'm like, oh, Oh, so I had to like jump in and start out swimming and I finally get to the paddleboard and they are freaking out. We're going to die. We're going to die. I'm like, it's okay. I said, I'll, I'll help you guys. And so I just get on back of the paddleboard and I just start kicking and kicking and kicking. And then I realize I'm not making any progress. Like, I'm not making any progress. Like, this is getting scary. And they're freaking out. And I'm like, it's okay. We'll, we'll figure this thing out. And I'm like, realizing that we're going further and further and further out into the open ocean. And pretty soon we start seeing, like, we're, we're, we're by some ships. And I'm like, this is not good. <laughs> Now, in God's immense providence and kindness, um, there happened to be like, it was like ex-Navy SEAL or something like that um, with his um, girlfriend named Amara. Now, my daughter Amara is here, and that's a unique name. And so I was like, okay, well, he said, hey, this isn't going to end well. And so um, I'm calling the Coast Guard. And they had already called like um, the local law enforcement. And so as I'm out there still in the water, my two kids are on the paddleboard, um, I start to hear you know, music to my ears, um, sirens. I'm like, okay, someone has made the phone call. Um, but then again, I'm like, I am stuck. And there's no one, no one around us, and it's getting scary. It seems like an impossible situation. There's no way that I can make it in, and we're just drifting and drifting and drifting. And finally, um, a giant Coast Guard ship comes in and um, throws out one of those little rafts. And then the first time it misses us, and then um, we flip over on the paddleboard. And this whole time, 
I'm thinking, I am going to be eaten by sharks. Like, I am just looking like a giant seal or something. I am their lunch. I am freaking out on this paddleboard. And, um, and I'm like, uh, Kayla and Savannah will survive, and they'll just have half a dad. I don't know what's going on. But it was just crazy. And then um, we, we flip over by the ship. The ship barely comes by us, our paddleboard. And then finally, they have to make another. And I guess when we finally got on the ship, they told us, they said, if you didn't get that second one, we were going to have to jump in and get you. And so, you know, Savannah's lighter. So, you know, we put her on the ship. And then um, Kayla is a little heavier. So we put her. And then there's me. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, man. Felt sorry for the poor Coast Guard. They had to haul me over the side of the ship. But then I realized once we got in there, man, it was so cold. And the adrenaline was just kicking in. And I just realized, wow, we were just rescued. We were just saved. And um, we, we, we recently went back to Monterey um, for like a day thing. And, I, and they were like, we're not getting paddle boards. I'm like, well, if you do, get a, get a life jacket. But, you know, when we think about rescue, when we think about salvation, oftentimes it's hard for us to, to think about it. You know, we hear about it in church. We hear about it on Easter Sunday. We hear these words salvation and, and rescue. But, but I think when we get it in a story, when we see it in a story, there's just something powerful and that we can relate to it. And I think that's what we're going to unpack today because, you know, it's interesting that even neuroscientists realize that our brains are wired for story. That when we hear a good story, our brain actually releases dopamine and that we can actually identify with stories that are good and compelling. I mean, I don't know if you have any, um, if there's any Marvel fans here, but for us, we love Marvel. And when um, Avengers Endgame, we went on opening night and we watched the movie and I could still still feel the electricity in the room when people are like, when, you know, Cap grabs Thor's hammer, like there's shouts. I mean, we love stories. We were meant for stories. And it's no wonder that 43% of the Bible um, is narrative or story. Um, stories are powerful. And so, you know, I think it's not an accident that when we consider the story of Easter or when we consider the story of our salvation, the story of our rescue, that when Jesus was talking about it a few, to a few before his actual death and resurrection on the Mount of Transfiguration, he referred to it as a famous story. And I want to read that this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, there's pew Bibles um, in your seats, but there's also, it will be on the screens behind you. But in in Luke chapter 9, um, Moses, or, uh, Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration um, talking with Moses and Elijah. And you're like, well, I thought they were dead. Yeah, they were dead. Um, but this is like a glorified moment. Jesus is revealing himself as who he really is on the Mount of Transfiguration. But he says something that I really want us to pay attention to this morning because I think it's going to help us understand the story of rescue better. And in verse 28, it says this. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. This is like a little glimpse of the resurrection, of the glorious Christ, of who he was, that he was more than just a prophet, he was more than just a good teacher, that there was something peculiar about this Jesus of Nazareth. And it says in verse 30, and behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. Um, and, and this represents the law and the prophets, the Old Testament. This, they're, they're talking with Jesus, and Jesus is at the center. Because the whole Bible is a unified story in the words of the Bible Project that points to Jesus. Verse 31, who appeared in glory. Okay, so this is the glorious one. This is God in the flesh, the word in the flesh. And look at this, though, and spoke of his departure, his departure, Okay, now you might have a footnote in your Bible. I'm reading from the ESV. And if you look in that footnote, it says, or the Greek word, exodus. The Greek word, exodus. So think about it. Jesus is talking with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, full of his glory. And it says he's speaking of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Think about that. He's thinking about his death and his resurrection. And he's talking to Moses and Elijah. And he's talking to them in the terms of this famous story 
the exodus. And the word exodus means a way out. It means a going out. It means getting out. And so for centuries, the Jewish people had celebrated the Passover where they remembered the Passover lamb and how that God had delivered them out of Egypt and into the promised land and given them the law and they had crossed the Red Sea and they, he had defeated the enemies of the people of God. And so Jesus is using very intentionally this word exodus to describe what he is about to accomplish in Jerusalem, in his death and his resurrection. And so this morning, I feel that since story is so powerful, we have to ask the question, why would Jesus speak about this Easter story that we all, most of us are familiar with, his death and his resurrection. Why would he use the Exodus story to tell us about the gospel? Because here's the thing, for many of us, we look at the Old Testament, it's a little scary, so we go, I don't want to read that. I'll read the gospels, maybe some Acts, some of Paul's letters, or Revelation, that's a little scary too. So I'll, maybe I'll just stick with Jesus and the gospels. Gospel of John is nice. And so um, we go Old Testament, but here's the thing. If you don't study and understand the depths of the Old Testament, then honestly, sometimes it's like watching TV in black and white when there's 4K, like ready to just pop. Have you ever been in one of those newer TVs at someone's house and you're like, this feels like I'm in the room with this person, right? And that's really what some of these Old Testament stories do. They provide depth and dimension so that we can rightly know and rightly see the power of this story of Easter, of his death and resurrection, or in Jesus' words, his exodus. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me back into the Old Testament, um, and we're going to look at a small passage of what the exodus is. I don't have time to go into the full exodus story. We're actually in a sermon series, and so I would love to invite you back next week um, to unpack the plagues and the Passover and eventually the Red Sea and the wilderness and the Ten Commandments later this fall. Um, but we're in East or Exodus. But the premise of this series is that the Exodus story is the Easter story. And, and I think Jesus gives us some breadcrumbs here to, to kind of understand and unpack um, this. And I think as we read Exodus 14, we're going to understand why Jesus said that his departure or his Exodus was going to be accomplished through his death and his resurrection. So in verse 1 of chapter 14, we're only going to read a few verses, I think up to uh, verse 14. It says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Piharath between Migdal and the sea, in front of Belsiphon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. So, I mean, a little backdrop in case you've never seen Charlton Heston say, let my people go, or you have kids and you've seen Prince of Egypt. The people of God found themselves in Egypt as slaves, and God called Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. He confronted Pharaoh, and he un leashed 10 plagues. And then finally, he, uh, Pharaoh relented and he said, get out of here. And then the Passover protected the people and Egypt. Whoever would put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, they would be saved. And so now they're finding themselves in a kind of between a rock and a hard place. Literally, they're in front of the Red Sea. And now, as we're going to read in just a moment, Pharaoh changes his mind and he's going to pursue the people to crush them. So let's keep reading in verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the people in Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they said so. And when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by pi Hiramoth in front of baal -Siphon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes. And I want you just to imagine, because I think good stories allow us to imagine. I want you to imagine some 600,000 men, all of the women and children, we're talking about like one, two million people here. 
There's so many people right here. And they think that they, they have just had the best day of their life. They've just been spared. They're on their way out of Egypt, and now they're, like, stuck. And they're like, why are we here? And then they hear the rumbling of chariots, right? They hear the rumbling of chariots, and then Pharaoh is coming with 600 of his chariots to destroy them. And all they can see in that moment is death. Death before them, death behind them. All they can see is certain death. And that's what the Moses picks up in verse 10. It says, lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they feared greatly. And wouldn't you? Wouldn't you be deathly afraid if before you was death and behind you was death and it just seemed like an impossible situation. There was no way out. And then in verse 11, they said to Moses, it is because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? And if you just like want the footnotes, that's not what they said at all. They were like, we're on board with this. Jesus, Yahweh is for us. Our Moses, Yahweh is for us. And we are so glad that you're here to rescue us. And, but now in face of certain death before them and certain death behind them, they are freaking out. What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And oftentimes in our own life, when we are faced with just what seems chaos and death, we sometimes find it easier to go back to what we used to know or what we're comfortable with. And sometimes that can be addiction, or sometimes that can be unhealthy relationships, or sometimes that can be something that's not good for us, but it's all that we know. And so, likewise, the, it, the Israelites are actually saying, we'd rather go be slaves in Egypt than right here, be free and die. And so it goes on in verse 13, and Moses, but look at what Moses says, and this is the, the moneymaker right here. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. So I'm going to pray right now, and then we're going to continue for a few more minutes. But I really hope that the Holy Spirit can help us see like the people of Israel had to see in that moment, because it was only by the grace of God that they were able to see. Would you just join me in a short prayer this morning? Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you of this story of the Exodus. And I ask and pray that it would begin to shape us even now how we see your Exodus your ultimate exodus or your way out of sin and death. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. But have you ever felt like that where it just seemed chaos was around you and you couldn't get out? It was before you and behind you. Um, now, this is an interesting um, tidbit. Um, in Genesis especially, Genesis 1, even Noah's flood, water was always representative of death and chaos. It was the unknown. I mean, have you ever been to the ocean? I mean, I can relate. I've been out there. Um, and have you, have you ever been out there and just been, this is scary when the waves start crashing. I mean, and so you imagine for these people that didn't know all of the, you know, have all the science that we have to understand the ocean. When they saw the ocean, it just felt chaotic and dark and even at times like, like spiritually dark. And so they, they, they understood the waters to be chaos and death. And so um, there's very much intention here when Moses finds himself with the people of God in front of chaos and death and behind them Pharaoh representing um, the evil one enemy pursuing them hotly their oppressors are behind them to destroy them and before them is chaos and death I mean this is a bad situation um, it reminds me of this morning um, because uh, I thought everything was good. We had our, you know, landscaping done. We got everything ready. I was feeling good about myself. And then um, I, I turned on the baptism because we have a baptism today. And then I went out to greet the bounce house guy. And then I realized like halfway through, uh-oh, I left the water on. I'm sprinting. And as you can see, it overflowed. 
I was like, thanks, Lord, for the hint. Water is chaos. Um, <sighs> so my, my already busy Easter morning now has more chaos in it. And, and yet what we find is um, our lives are full of chaos. They're full of what we might call in, in church the storm, right? We, we, we know what chaos, we know what death is, and, and sin brings chaos. And that's really what the plagues show us, is that when we harden our heart towards God, when we turn away from the source of life, death ensues. When we turn away from the source of wisdom, foolishness ensues. When we turn away from the author of creation, decreation happens. This is what we understand. I, I heard one preacher say that we all know this. For example, if you're, if you're married this morning and, and, and the person offends you or hurts your feelings or does something that you didn't like and you choose not to forgive them, chaos will begin to ensue in that relationship or a friendship. Um, when, when jealousy and all these things that the, the Bible warns us against, all these things ensue when we turn away from wisdom, when we turn away from light, dark darkness happens. And so that's what we find. And, and what we see here at the Red Sea is that God's provision for them is to see something that they could not see. It's to see life in death. That the way to life was through death. That the people of God had to travel through chaos, through death, and the only way to do that was because of of a mediator or someone who would stand in their place in the middle for the whole people of God. And that's really the picture that I don't have time to read this morning, but if you go on to read, what you see is that as Moses extends his staff, you see a wall on its left and a wall on its right, and you see a narrow way leading through chaos and through death over to life. And then Pharaoh and his whole army pursues them into the chaos, into the water, and they are vanquished once and for all. And it, it got me, re, uh, reminded me of how Satan thought he had won on Good Friday. Right? It, it got me thinking, because as Pharaoh thought, for sure we have them. But when he thought that he had won in his pride, what happened? It ultimately led to his defeat. And in the same way, church, what we look at with the resurrection is that when Jesus passed into death, Satan thought he had won. But it was actually in the death of Jesus that death was defeated. For sin had been conquered. The wrath of God had been satisfied in the Passover lamb. And that's why the story of Exodus has to be coupled with the Passover lamb, because it was the Passover lamb, this lamb of God that was slain for the, before the foundations of the world, that was spotless, without defect. It was slain, and so that death could pass over us, and that we could pass through death because of our Redeemer because of our exodus, because ultimately Moses was a shadow and the substance is Christ. The substance of what we worship on Easter Sunday is that Jesus Christ is the greater exodus, that he is the ultimate way out of sin. He is the ultimate way out of slavery, he, uh, of slavery to sin, of bondage and addiction, of disappointment and discouragement, all these things that I heard one person say it this way, that in Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin is death. But maybe a better way of saying that is that the wages of sin is disintegration, is decreation. When we choose to sin, our life begins to decay and disintegrate because God is the author of life. And when he gives us his word and his wisdom, it's for us to flourish and to be fruitful. But all of us have sin and all of us have seen in our life decay and discouragement and disintegration or what the Bible just would call death. And the only way to defeat death was for God himself in Jesus to defeat death by dying in our place for our sin and then to be buried in the grave. And even as we are about to honor the Lord through baptism this morning, what is baptism? Baptism. Why are we baptized in water? What does water represent? Water represents what? Death and chaos. And in the same way as 
the people of God passed through death on chaos in the Red Sea. Jesus passes through death itself. And then when we baptize someone, what we are doing is saying, you are passing through death to life because of Jesus. That's what it means. And you leave the death and you leave the chaos behind you. Because ultimately crossing over or passing through the Red Sea or passing through death is only because of the Passover lamb. Jesus Christ who died in our place for our sins. And, and this is a, a, a thing that for, for many of us, if I were to ask you, and it reminds me of a question that an old preacher by the name of um, Martin Lloyd Jones would Martin Lloyd Jones would ask, and he would ask someone before their baptism. He would ask them to kind of see where they're at in their view of the gospel, and he would say, um, "Are you a Christian?" And their response was really telling on whether or not they knew the gospel, because for many people, this is their response, and it may be even your response. Well, I try. I try try to be a good person. I, I try to go to church. I try to do this. I was meeting with someone the other night, and, and they were going into a surgery, and, um, as soon as, and they hadn't seen a pastor probably for a long time. And the first thing that they did was say, I haven't been to church in a long time. Have you been there? Where you feel like, oh, I haven't done this or that, so I, I I, I, I need to, you know, do something because obviously I'm not meeting the, you know, standard here with God. And he would say, you don't even know the gospel because the gospel is that one minute you're dead in your sins and the next minute you are alive in Christ. Like that. You've crossed over from death to life. That's the gospel. And it's because of grace that we can cross over. It's what G um, John and John's gospel says, those who believe have crossed over or passed through from death to life. You've gone from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It's like that, and it's all because of grace. It's all because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And what we see here is that Moses says, don't look at your enemy. Don't look at Pharaoh. Don't look at your surrounding circumstances. Don't look at the chaos and the death around you. I want you to look at your salvation. I want you to see salvation. And here's where we truly find something absolutely wondrous in the scripture this morning. And that is this, that when Moses said in verse 14, he said this, I'm sorry, in verse 13, and Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord. Now, if in your Bible it's all caps, that means Yahweh. And in this word salvation, where we, it's this word that we find in the name of Jesus himself. Jesus is a way of saying it, but Yeshua would be a more accurate way of saying it. And it's the Lord is salvation. So in another way of saying this, what Moses is really saying here is see the Jesus of Yahweh. You could actually put that in there. See the salvation. See the Yeshua of Yahweh. See the salvation of the Lord. See Jesus of the Lord. So we have in the, Old, in the New Testament, Jesus saying, this is my departure. This is my exodus. And now we have in Moses saying, see the salvation of Yahweh, the salvation of our God. Do you see the connection here? And it's all of grace. He says, you don't have to do anything. I like what one pastor said. He says, you know, everyone that walked through the Red Sea, I'm sure some people were like, hey, this is great. We won. God is victorious. He's fighting for us. And then there were probably other Israelites passing through the Red Sea going, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Right? And, and the good news that we can celebrate today is that we are not saved by our faith. We are saved by the object of our faith. It's not the strength of your faith that saves you. It is the object of your faith that saves you. And Jesus said on the cross, what? It is finished. And we celebrate that it was accomplished with the resurrection. And so this morning, I don't know where you are at, but I will read again verse 14. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. That's the good news of Easter. The good news of Easter is that the Lord fought for us. 
when we could not. I tried to clean, I tried to pressure wash the playground yesterday. I tried to mop up all of this water. And you know what I kept on realizing? I can't get it all. No matter how hard I try, I can't squirt off all the dirt. I can't get up all the water. And that is a picture of the gospel because here's the deal. All your effort, all your trying, it will not work. You cannot mop up all your sin. You cannot clean up all the chaos. The only one who can do that is Jesus Christ who died in our place for our sins and then rose from the dead victorious so that we can sing no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. This is the good news of the gospel. So if you are feeling that I got to mop up my mess, I got to mop up my chaos, I got to do this in my own strength, just listen to the words of Moses Stand firm, fear not. See the salvation of the Lord. See Jesus, the Lord of our salvation, the one who came to rescue us. See him. Let the Lord fight for you and just be silent. And that's hard for some of us. But that's the gospel. That's grace. It's something that we simply receive. We receive it by faith as we look to Christ. Salvation is in seeing the Savior. That's salvation. It's saying, I can't do this myself. I need a Savior. That's salvation. You're like, what's the catch? There's no catch. Jesus paid it all. He went to the cross. He rose from the dead. It changes everything. If it's not true, then we should leave now. Never come back. But if it's true, then my goodness. Jesus is irresistible. And I can sing no sin or no fear in death, no guilt in life. And I can, yes, I will not um, have a, you know, super free from trial, free from problem life. But I can know that the two big ones, sin and death, are taken care of. All because of Jesus. He is our way out of death and chaos. He is the one who has victoriously rose from the dead, conquering sin and Satan so that we can have peace with God and peace with one another. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your grace. We thank you that you are the one who stood in the middle of death and chaos. You are the one who, like Moses, stretched out your hands with the authority of God to part the waters of death and chaos. And for some of us in this room, we are in it. We, we, we feel the death and chaos. We feel it all around us. And we have tried our best. We have tried to mop it up and to clean it up and to pressure washer it off with our good works and our Sunday school attendance or our just being a good person. And I pray that this morning we would see there's no way. We can't get it all. But Jesus, you paid it all. You paid it all on the cross. And then you rose from the dead to show us that the payment had been accepted and that we can now be accepted by the Father in heaven. That we can have, um, that our, you were decreated so that we could be recreated in you. That we could be new creations in Christ. That the old is gone, the new has come. That like baptism, we pass through the waters of death with you, Jesus, and we come out a new creation. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is everything. And Jesus, you are irresistible. You welcome sinners and you welcome the poor and the outcasts. You welcome the re rebels and those who have stubborn hearts. You welcome the proud. You welcome us all to come and to see salvation, to see Jesus.
So I pray this morning that we would not look to our pharaohs and our Egypt and our bondage and our sin and our guilt and the circumstances, chaos and death, but we would see Jesus by faith as we hear the gospel and everything would change. If you have never lifted up your eyes off of yourself or lifted up your eyes off of your circumstances and the chaos and death that's all around, if you've never done that, and today you would see Christ as the way out, you would see Jesus as the way out of sin and death, and you would say, I want to cross over this morning by grace from death to life. And if that's what you want to do this morning, I just want to pray for you. Can I just have everyone head bowed and eyes closed? If that's you, I just want to pray for you. There's nothing magic about this. Salvation comes from seeing the Savior. But I just want to pray for you. So if that's, if that's you this morning and you would say, I want to, I've seen Jesus for the first time and he is my all-sufficient Savior. He is my rescue. He is the way out. He is my exodus. Would you just lift your hand so I could pray for you? Anyone? Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that it's not the strength of our faith, but it's the object of our faith that saves us. By grace, we have been saved. And this, not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. You are the King of kings, and we worship you this morning. Thank you for those that see Jesus. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would even now baptize them and you and then, Lord, lead them to the place where they would want to be baptized as a public testimony of them passing through the waters of death with you, Jesus. This is our great gospel, church. This is what everything hinges on. All because of the King of Kings.